It's good to be here. It's good to see all of you. Uh, I'm excited about our, our series that Jeff kicked off last week, talking about Kingdom DNA, where we're, we're dealing with, you know, strands of, of emphases that are part of the kingdom of God, but that we particularly as a spiritual family feel very, very commissioned and called to. And, and last week, Jeff talked about spiritual family, who we are together, how we love and, and, and live and serve and give together. And, um, and this week, I want to talk about living with urgency for the hour, living with a heart that's watchful and wise in a time where the earth is going through many shakings and many crises. Um, one of the interesting things when you read the New Testament is it's so clear that the New Testament writers, they lived with what we would call an apocalyptic expectation. And that just simply means they lived looking for the return of the Lord. They lived with hearts that were alive, watchful, and waiting, and, and, and living expectant of Jesus' second coming. You know what's awesome about Jesus? He's not dead. He's alive. He's not just figuratively alive. He is literally, physically alive. He walked out of the grave. He spent days on the earth, 50 days, instructing his own disciples in the kingdom of God, and then he blasted off. He, he went extraterrestrial right in front of them. A cloud of glory came, took him up. He went up into the air, and they stood there in shock as he was being escorted by angels to the right hand of the Father. And the angels, they say the most interesting thing in that moment. I, I mean, why stand you here gazing? Like, it's almost like the angels are like, hey, 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 what are y'all looking at? Why do you stand here gazing? This Jesus who you saw ascend, he will return in the same manner in which you saw him go. And beloved, this is our blessed hope that we know there is a glorious appearing that Jesus is coming. He's coming to a planet near you very soon to take over, to rule and reign from Zion. The scripture is really clear. He's going to teach us his ways. And the age to come is going to be an age where the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the seas. Well, here's the thing. There's like 150 chapters in the Bible that talk about the day of the Lord, which is the second coming of the Lord. They talk about the age to come, the end of this age and the age to come, the birthing of the kingdom and fullness. There's like 150 chapters in the Bible that talks about it. And here's a challenge that we face in the church in the West, especially, is a lot of times people think, well, you know, end times, I don't know, I don't know if I really can understand that or if I really want to get into that. And so they think that must just be for the theologians over there. And by doing that, they take 150 chapters of the Bible and they just throw them out. And beloved, that cannot be how we live our Christianity. We need to take the whole counsel of the word. We need to take all the passages that instruct our hearts and how we're to live this life and how we're to position our hearts looking for and hastening the day of the Lord that we would be people with an expectant, watchful, and waiting outlook on Jesus' second coming. It was the way the New Testament writers lived, and it's really the way that the church in every age is supposed to live. So I'm going to talk about urgency from the, for the hour today. I'm going to speak out of Matthew 24. So if you have your Bible or your, your device, you can turn over there. And I just want to have a word of prayer again. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you stand again. I felt like we were doing aerobics there for a minute. Okay, up, down, up, down, up, down. Did you ever go to one of those, now I'm just going to ramble. Did you ever go to one of those churches where everybody knew when to stand and they didn't actually give the uh, deal, but you didn't know? I was always the guy that like, oh, they're up again. Oh, down? Oh, up? Oh, wait, how do we do this? You know, you know, it always freaked me out. At least we give you the warning. We might stand a lot, but we tell you when. Anyway, all right, let's pray. Now we shall pray. Sitting. I'm in a mood today. 
Lord, we love you. We love your word. We love that we can gather. We're so grateful for who you are, how you lead, and how you speak. And Lord, we want to tell you we trust you. We love you and we trust you. And Jesus, as we look at what the scripture says about the the day and the hour that you're going to return, I pray that you would grip our hearts with urgency, with watchfulness and alertness. And let this strand of, of the kingdom DNA, let it be something that's rich in our spiritual family, in the Newbridge IHOP family, that we would be watching, waiting with oil in our lamps and hearts that are wise. Lord, we love you. Help me to speak this morning as an oracle. Stand with me. Hold my hand, I ask. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Okay, so Matthew 24 is the beginning of Jesus' main teaching on the end times, on the second coming. He, he is doing this right there at the end of his life. It's known as the Olivet Discourse. And he takes the better portion of Matthew 24 and 25, and he exp- explains to his disciples specific signs of the hour in which the Lord will return and details about the greatest time of crisis the earth will ever see, which is right before the Lord returns. And then he gives several parables in chapter 25 of how believers are supposed to position their hearts in light of those signs. And so what I want to do today is I want to deal with just just a portion of Matthew 24 where Jesus talks about the signs of his coming. What happened in this passage is this. Jesus had just been in the temple courts, and he, he, he released this prophecy to his disciples, and it struck them. The prophecy was this. He said, not one stone of this temple will be left upon another. In other words, this place, this temple, it's going to get completely torn down. And when the disciples heard that, that was shocking. That was stunning. Not only was the temple the religious center, it was the political center at that time of the nation of Israel. It would be like saying, here's what's going to happen. The Congress, the White House, and the Washington Cathedral will all be completely torn down. And so when the disciples heard this, they're thinking to themselves, that would be catastrophic and it's already happened before Jesus because it happened about 600 BC when Babylon invaded Israel. And now Jesus is saying it boldly to them, not one stone of this temple will remain on another. It will be torn completely down. And that causes questions to arise in the disciples, and they specifically ask, what are the signs of your second coming? What are the signs of your return? And so then Jesus begins to answer their question about his second coming, and he gives real clear details. And so let's just go ahead and begin to read what he says in response to their questions. So Matthew 24 Verse four, it says this, Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, it marks a transition. He says, you know, then, in other words, after the beginning of sorrows, then they will hand you over to be persecuted and will kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be led astray and will betray many and hate one another, and many false prophets will deceive many, will arise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. 
And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the whole world as a witness, and then the end will come. So here's Jesus giving clear signs, answering their specific and direct question. And beloved, for us, it's critical that we listen to the words of Jesus, understand the signs, and then I believe this, that the admonition to the church in every age, including our age, is to look at those signs and compare them to the context of the earth in which we actually live and see if we're in the hour. See what the context of the earth looks like compared to the signs that Jesus gives. And so when I look at these signs, I personally realize there has to be a way that we identify signs and they actually are really signs. In other words, we, we sort of have a criteria to know that this is a sign and, and it's speaking to me of the season that the Lord was talking about. What do I mean by that? I, I mean this. You can't have a sign appear for a week in one little city somewhere off in who knows where town, and that is a sign that's supposed to alert the whole earth. It's got to be a sign that shows the earth that we're in the hour in which the Lord returns. It shows the planet. And so for it to do that, the signs, they have to be global in their implication. They have to appear over time so the earth can see the sign. And they have to be at a measure that's never been seen before. Does that make sense? In other words, this, for the sign to be a legitimate sign, it's actually have to meet sort of a threshold of signage so that we can actually see the sign. And so when I look at these things that Jesus says, I realize, okay, they have to be in place over time. They have to be more than the earth has ever seen before. So to distinguish it, that now we're in a different hour, and they've got to be global. And I want to read through these signs and I just want to tell you this, I've done a ton of work on this. I'm not asking you to, to take my word on the research I've done. I would encourage you to go do your own research. But as I walk through these signs, I'll tell you my findings. I've spent hours researching these. I geek out on stuff like this sometimes. But I've gone through and done the work, and I, was, I thought, you know what? This will be the litmus for me. This will be the litmus test. If these signs aren't global more than every time, any other time the earth has ever seen, if, if these signs haven't been in place for a long period of time, then there's no way they're really going to tell us that we're in that season. But if they meet those criteria, then that means we need to take something very, very seriously. So let's just walk through these. I'll share a few thoughts about them. He says, first, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Deception through false Christs. So I began to, to look that up. I began to research that and look at the last, you know, 100 years was really my, my criteria. And I was blown away. If you search guys that are saying that they are Jesus and are leading religious movements, it is shocking. I'm not talking just about like the person that maybe, you know, they had a mental issue and ended up in a, you know, mental health facility. I'm talking about there are real people who say they are Jesus Christ incarnate that are leading real movements with millions of followers. It's happening in mass, and there's movements that you know of, and there's movements that you don't know of. If you get into the, into the root system of Rastafarianism, what you find out is that the founder said he was a second coming of Jesus Christ. You know, and people think, well, that's just cool music, it's reggae. No, that's a false Christ who created Rastafarianism. There's a, 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 a one guy, he just says he's the man Jesus Christ. He has a million followers in Central America. What's odd about him 
is he uses the number 666. Last time I checked, that was the number of the beast. That wasn't a Jesus number. I just, just saying. Antichrist spirit manifesting through false Christ. Beloved, in the history of the earth, we've never seen the number of false Christs, false messiahs, people parading themselves as if they're Jesus. It's happening in the earth at a, at a level that has never been before. Secondly, he says this, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now, I've done the work and I've studied really from the beginning of the 19th century to now. Uh, and there's a major turn that happens in world history uh, during World War I. In fact, if you go from World War I and you go 100 years, which is about, you know, we're about 105 years later now. What you find is sociologists will tell you that that 100 years, the number of deaths that took place in military conflicts in that 100 years is more deaths than have taken place in the history of the world up until that time. They call that uh, century the great bloodletting because the, the, the number of people that, that were uh, killed in, in uh, military conflicts, there's a term they use, the, the great hemoclysm. It just means bloodletting. It's the bloodiest century the earth has ever seen, not by a little. When you watch the graph, it goes like this, 1900, boom. It goes off the chart. Now, this brings me to a very pertinent subject because this past week, we had a military conflict that happened between the United States and Iran. And tensions have been bubbling and rising with Iran over the last really a couple years and then real concentrated in the last month. And um, what happened was the United States uh, did an attack on an Iranian general who was identified as a, as a, uh, a terror uh, agent and, then, uh, and, and, and he was killed and then Iran struck back by shooting 15 rockets onto an American base in Iraq. Well, they retaliated on Tuesday by Tuesday night, my phone is blowing up like a pinball machine because believers are like, hey, what's happening? Is this the end of the age? Is Iran the Antichrist? Is this World War III? I heard this is World War III. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And, and I'm looking at that, and I'm like, Huh? There's a lot of fear about this Iran thing. So I turn on the, the news channel, and me and my, my family were sitting there watching it. And we're, we're an equal opportunity uh, a news people. We just, we go CNN, Fox, MSNBC, Fox, CNN. And we just kind of bounce. And literally, this, this happened. We're on CNN. The newscaster starts saying stuff, and somebody pipes up and goes, that's terrible. That's not the Lord. Well, let's try the other channel. Flip over there. Oh, this guy, he's always, listen to what he's saying. That's not the Lord. That's terrible. Next station. Listen, oh, no, listen, that's not the word of the Lord. None of the news channels, it was shocking. None of the news channels were giving us the word of the Lord. <laughs> You'd think, though, that that's where we get the word of the Lord based on how believers act oh, yeah. by listening to the news channels. And so finally, somebody piped up and goes, I've gotten the information I need. Can we just turn this off? Yep, boom. But here's what I realized, that there was a lot of fear stirred in people. There was a lot of tension stirred in people. And then I got a, a message from one of our missionaries who's in the Middle East. And I hadn't been paying attention a lot to the social media feeds, but she reached out and she said, hey, listen, can you make an announcement? <laughs> I was like, I'm not making an announcement, but... Anyway, she says, can you say something about this? And I guess I am now by virtue of telling you the story. But she goes, here we are. We're out here trying to pray and share the gospel in the Middle East. And we're reading all this stuff that American Christians are saying about the nation that we're in. And it's making our job super difficult right now. Can you tell them to stop, please? I was like, oh. 
And, and she literally said, it's not actually not the American media. It's actually the American Christians on social media. At the same time, in December, the Lord was moving on us and the leadership team here. It was moving on our heart that we really wanted to sow finances into the nations to see people saved and see the gospel work go forth in all of our bases across the nations. And, and so we, we put it out to our congregation. We want to raise, raise $50,000. And let me just brag on Jeff for half a second. <laughs> I remember we, were gonna, we said, okay, we're going to take my missions offering. And, and we're like, yeah, we're praying about it. We're like, yeah, that's good. And I'm thinking in my heart, maybe we'll raise $20,000. $20, That'd be a good number to give to the nations. Jeff goes, I feel like I've heard from the Lord. It's $50,000 we have to raise. I went, amen. <laughs> 50000 That's a lot of money. We got like, dang, that's a lot of money. But I didn't act like it. I went, praise God, brother. He goes, yeah, I've heard from the Lord. I go, okay. So we just, we just kind of just agreed together in prayer. We said, okay, Lord, we're asking for $50,000. Do you know we raised $55,000? Come on, y'all. Jeff's, Jeff's faith got us all in line to carry the ball over the goal line and then some. But in that, we also felt stirred as a leadership team uh, that we weren't just to call the congregation to giving, to personally give, but we wanted to give something. You know, David said, I won't give the Lord anything that doesn't cost me something. And we wanted to give out of our emergency funds, so into the nation, into the nations. And so we prayed and we felt the Lord tell us to give $25,000 additional. And we felt like he gave us the location. Guess where? Iran. And so we sowed at the end of the year our 55,000 and an additional 25,000 into the revival in Iran with this being our faith that it, we were, gonna, were buying Bibles for Iran and that every single dollar would represent a soul. So $25,000 for 25,000 souls in Iran. And we felt the stirring of the Lord. We felt like the Lord really ministering through that. We felt like we, we, we want to sow. Even though we have many financial needs in our midst, we want to sow right into that. And we want to see the, the gospel go forth in, in Iran and Middle Eastern nations and Africa and all sorts of places in Asia. So here, in the middle of all this tension and turmoil with Iran, we have got, we've got a seed in the ground. We're believing for revival. And the message coming off of the, the media and on so many social media threads is, Iran, they're bad guys. They're, they're like, you know, the devil, and they hate America, and they're chanting hate, hatred to America. And so there's this real interesting tension going on and, and I'm hearing the Lord on it, and he's saying, I have a people in that nation that loves me, that I am trying to reach for the kingdom of God, pray into it, sow into it, and send people into it. So here's what happens. Jeff gets moved. He says, I think we should commemorate this offering, and he does some research, and he finds, he finds a tree. Now, we don't do a lot of, you know, prophetic personal prophetic acts, but he felt strong about this. We prayed about it. I said, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to plant a tree on our property here to commemorate that seed sown into Iran. And, and, and so, you know, you, you go and you research and find, and Jeff finds this tree, and we have this tree sitting out there, and we got to figure out schedules and trying to put it together. And man, it's January. Do you plant a tree in January? Dear God, what if you plant the tree about the seed for Iran and the tree dies? Dear Lord, is this, you know, <laughs> extra intercession for the tree? So anyhow, <laughs> we figure it all out. Well, I thought it was going to be this day. Well, no, we can, can we do it on this day? We literally have to last minute change. We're going to do it Monday, last minute change. We end up having, a, everybody can do it on Wednesday. Tuesday night, the rockets fly. Tuesday night, my phone's blowing up. Tuesday night, people are getting gripped with fear. And Wednesday, we're putting that tree in the ground, praying for revival in Iran. And man, I'm, my heart was getting so instructed by the testimony of the Lord versus the testimony of the world. And Jesus, here's Jesus' position. Jesus' position is this. 
CNN, Embassy, Fox News, your social media feed, none of them are breaking the news. He goes, I've already broken the news. I broke it in Matthew 24 when I told you a sign of my coming would be wars and rumors of wars. And man, it was such a rumor of wars. Because by the time the president makes the statement, by the time the Iranian uh, leader makes the statement, everything is de-escalated. I'm not saying it's all perfect. It's not, it's not like everybody's just loving each other. But I mean, it's way de-escalated. But here's what I watched. For about 48 hours, I watched a rumor of war throw people into complete fear. Lose all their inner healing and all the fruit of the Spirit over one rumor of war. And it's, it's a burden to me because it lets me see not only are we distant from Jesus' words on this matter, but we are woefully unprepared for when the thing really comes down. So Jesus said, wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation. The Greek word nation there is ethnos. It literally means people group against people group. It's, it's the conflicts that we've seen predominantly over the last 50 years where you have different people groups fighting each other. The, the best example that, that comes to my mind is in Rwanda. There was two different people groups that got into a, uh, an ethnic clash. A million people died over just this ethnic infighting. Do you realize that the English word genocide was, it was first coined in 1954? That word is like not even 70 years old. There wasn't a word in the English language for genocide prior to the 1950s. What does that tell you? It tells you this, that the context of things in the earth had, had changed and they actually had to come up with a new word to define what it meant when people in people groups fight against other people in people groups and try to exterminate them. That's a new thought in the last 70 years. When we look at the ethnic cleansing and the genocide things that have happened in the last century, it is off the charts and in, in the English language, it's a new idea in the last 70 years. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. That's military. That's nation states fighting other nation states. Do you realize there's never been anything like this last century? We've not had one world war. We've had two. Millions lost their lives in wars just in the last 100 years. Nothing like that has ever happened, not even close in human history. Just our last hundred years, the, the number of deaths in wars, it it's, it's eclipses all the deaths up to that time uh, before. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes. I'll give you just a sentence or two on each of these. Famines. Of course, you and I don't feel famines because we live in the United States, but when you look online and you look at like the World Hunger Organization and you look at all the guys that are doing all the work on, on this, uh, what you find is this, they classify the earth in three categories. There's a third that is well fed, there's a third that lives in hunger, and there's a third that actually lives in famine. And, and, and somebody looks at that, I remember this, when I was in college, this kid challenging me, he goes, well if God is good, how come there's famine? Why doesn't he just give everybody food? And I thought, man, good question. And I remember now doing the, the research on this. You know what I found? That annually, our planet produces 15% more food than we need to feed every single person on the planet. Do you know the reason why it doesn't get there? Humans. Human wickedness. God is good, but the sin of the human heart is diabolical. Famines, pestilences, pestilences, think disease. 
I, some of you are, are old enough in here. I remember coming up, uh, you know, I, I was born in the 70s, child, born in 1970, child of the 80s. I remember coming up, they had this new thing, HIV. Some of you all remember a time before there was, an, there was AIDS or HIV. Many of you remember when the Aryan flu, the, the, the bird flu thing came out, and, and that thing is... A, it's a killer. And, and, and now the, the most recent thing that I've researched is this thing called MRSA. Raise your hand if you know what MRSA is. Yeah. It's this staph infection that you cannot kill. Multiply resistant staphylococcus arachis. And, and there's, there's a disease that there's no answer for it. constantly happening. It feels like there's a new one every two, three years. Pestilences. When you look at the number of incidents of, of infectious disease and things like that, and you look at the last 100 years, really, you can go to the last 50, it goes Boom, the chart goes like this from human history. You got a few spikes. You got Black Death in Europe. Like there's this like three to seven year window, depending on how you measure it. And then, you know, it kind of goes up and down a little slow. Bang, it goes off the charts over the last 50 years. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes. That word earthquakes is a Greek word seismos. It's where we get the seismic. It also means tempests. It also means storms. In this category of earthquakes, it would be the earthquakes, it would be storms, hurricanes, it would be tsunamis, everything of that like. Man, you know what's interesting about the world we live in? There is a new tragic earthquake or storm that happens about every two or three years. Each one of them, the Red Cross blows up with relief funds, and by the time the next one hits, we forget forgotten about the previous one. And there are so many that are happening constantly, and when you actually do the data, and Georgia Tech, actually, I don't even like to quote Georgia Tech because I'm a dog's fan, glory to God. <laughs> but Georgia Tech did the data, did the research on earthquakes and storm systems. They, they, I mean, it's not even close. What's in place, what's been happening in the earth over the last 100 years, and if you dial into 50, it's even, even more obvious. Compared to the rest of human history, it's not even close. What am I telling you? I'm telling you this, and I'm gonna say a bold statement, and I'm, and I'm asking you, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the signs, consider the criteria for it to actually be a sign, and then look into these things yourself, but I'm gonna make a bold statement. Jesus said, when you see all seven of these things happening, it's the beginning of the birth pangs. And the bold statement that I'm gonna make is this, I believe we're clearly living in the season of the beginning of birth pangs now. I believe that's what's happening in the earth. As you're seeing these crises explode on the global scale, as you're seeing wars, rumors of wars, nations against nations, pestilence, famines, earthquakes, as we're seeing these things rise in false Christ and deception, I'm telling you what's going on is what Jesus said would happen. We're living in the season that, that shows us his coming is near. Now listen, this is the most glorious time to be alive and the most intense time to be alive. The end of the age is gonna be the, the, the most challenging, most difficult time the earth has ever seen. Matthew 24, 21, Jesus says, there will never be another time as severe as this time. The time of the greatest tribulation the earth has ever seen. At the same time, it's gonna be the time of the greatest glory the earth has ever seen. He's gonna pour out his spirit on all flesh. The sons and daughters are gonna prophesy and all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There'll be a revival spirit in every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. This is what's coming to the planet. With great shaking, there's coming great glory. <laughs> Beloved, this is, this is the finest hour to be alive. But here's the deal. If we live way down with lusts, 
If we live deluded with sort of the temperature of the culture, if we live tuned in to to the news channel as our message of how we're supposed to operate, we will be completely out of sync with the Son of God in an hour in which the church is supposed to be uniting with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the bride crying, come. And beloved, this is our time to get alert, to get watchful, to be waiting and fasting and prayer and gospel proclamation as the, the, the dynamic challenges of the end of the age continue to grow. Now, what's interesting to me is this. He uses this term, beginning of sorrows or beginning of birth pains. He uses it really intentionally because he's describing the context of the earth that's necessary for the birthing of the kingdom of God in fullness. Our Jesus is returning. He's gonna rule and reign. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as waters cover the sea. This is coming. And he's describing the context that will birth that into the earth. I remember, I will never, ever forget when my wife called me when she was nine months pregnant with our first child. My wife She, my wife is the strongest human being I've ever met. She worked to the day that she had our baby as a middle school teacher, glory to God. Yes, some of you teachers went, oh. And I remember, I get this call, it's the middle of the morning. She's supposed to be in class. She calls and I'm like, hey, hey, what's going on? Uh, And she goes, um, I think I'm in labor. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what do we do? What do we do? I knew it was coming. It just, I just, I don't know. I didn't think it was coming. I don't, I don't know how we do that. I know this is getting ready to happen, but somehow I didn't plan on it. I'm like, oh, no, do I need to come get you? What, what do we do? Can you drive? Do we need a stretcher? What do we do? Somebody, okay, somebody get some towels and hot water. <laughs> I started freaking out. She goes, no, I can drive. I'm like, be careful, like uh, something. uh, Okay, you're coming home? Yes, I'm coming home. (gasps) She comes home and the labor pangs are 15 minutes apart. I'm thinking, man, she says she's in labor, it's it's game on. Any of y'all that are parents know, it's not game on. 15 minutes apart, this may not even be the real thing. So, you know, I'm like, man, we got we to gotta get her checked out. We got we to gotta go like, you know, get the towels and water. I don't know. I don't know why they do that in every movie, but they do. Towels and water. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, she's pretty cool. She's like, I got you, babe. Don't worry. You're going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she's 15 minutes. I'm like, she's like, I'm good. You're good? And then it starts shortening. They start going 10 minutes. And now they're a little more intense. And it's 10 minutes. It's eight minutes now. And it's starting to hit on a rhythm. I mean, those things get down to five minutes. And I'm like, this is getting, it's like, it's time. Do we go? Do we go? What do we do? And some of you guys, you're pros at this. You've done this. And, you know, you can go to the hospital at five minutes, but man, you do that, you might have another 24 hours. And then, you know, there's, I remember she says, hey, I think we've got to go now. And I'm like, now, now? I'm like, now. We get there and, you know, they're checking her out. and It's intense. It's every three minutes. Bang, bang, bang. And I'm like, oh my God, baby's going to be here. And the doctor's like, or the, the midwife is like, about another eight hours. I'm like, eight hours? What are you talking about? Well, the context of her body has to change enough to birth this baby. And I'm like, man, I'm like, this has been intense. And, 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 And she's like, oh no, she hasn't even gone into transition yet. That's transition. What's, what's transition, you know? And I'll never forget it. 
she goes into transition and her body is shaking and the pain is racking her body and she's sweating and she can't stand still. And those birth pains are hitting like this. There's a change and it goes from the beginning of birth pangs to the heavy labor. Jesus used that, he used that uh, example to instruct us. Every time, every time a woman goes in labor, it's a testimony of Jesus' return. Oh man. And that, after that moment of transition, it's on now. That baby's coming whether you like it or not. It's gonna happen. And that labor gets so severe. And I'm over there like, anything I can do, can I help you at all? And she's like, shut up. It's not really true. My wife was like, oh. I'm like, babe. She's like, I got you. You're fine. I'm going to have this baby. You want me to hold your hand? (laughs) Until the baby comes. You see, everybody wants the baby, but we're so accustomed in our culture, we don't want any birth pangs. So what do we do? (laughs) Y'all know what, we got epidurals, we can schedule that C-section. I'm not down on you if you had to have an epidural. God bless you for your epidural, that was brilliant. Good job, smart but we're so accustomed to getting out of the the challenge, the trial of it, we imagine somehow the birthing of the kingdom is gonna come with some holy epidural. It's not. It's not coming with an epidural. It's coming with everything that can be shaken will be shaken. It's coming with birth pangs that are going to rock this planet. Isaiah was clear. He says, the whole planet will reel and totter like a drunkard. I'm telling you, there is a time of severity coming on the earth like we have never seen before. And look what Jesus says when he gets, when he says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation. Here's what he says. They will hand you over to be persecuted. They will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. See, when you signed up for Christianity, I doubt you signed up for the vitriol and the hatred of all the nations coming against you because you say yes to Jesus. But when you say yes to Jesus, you say yes to all of Jesus. You say yes to the the sweet and the sour, the good and the trial. You say yes to be persecuted with the Son of God, just like you say yes to be risen with the Son of God. He says, you're going to be hated by all nations. And then he says these statements. He says, the love of many will grow cold. Many will betray one another. He's not talking about them out there betraying one another. He's not talking about the love of the world growing cold. The love of the world is cold. He's talking about the church. And the New Testament uh, uh, testimony, the New Testament witness is this, that at the same time that there is a revival spirit being poured out and glory is rising, at the same time, there is a great falling away that's going to happen. I'm telling you, the drama that's going to unfold to wrap up this age is going to be the most shocking, plot-twisting, mind-blowing thing, and it's going to end with Jesus with a spotless bride that loves him through every trial and tribulation and every difficulty. It's going to end with the glory of the Lord being poured out on all flesh. It's going to end with the usurper, Satan, through Antichrist being driven off the planet. It's going to end with the kingdom of God coming in power. Beloved, this is our portion. This is what we get to be into. And we have been theologically talked out of being in the game in the last two minutes. And Jesus never got us out of the game in the last two minutes. There wasn't a holy epidural. What he did was he 
saw to it that you would be alive on the earth during the time of the greatest trial because he wanted to put his best players in the game for the last two minutes. I still believe that there is a spotless bride. I still believe that there is a, a church that will stand through trial. I still believe there's a people that will love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. We don't get purified without fire. We get purified through fire. And beloved, this is the New Testament witness. This is our portion. And so when I say to you boldly that I believe we're living in an hour that Jesus already identified as the beginning of birth pangs, then I look at his admonitions in this passage and I say, that's what my heart needs to be instructed with because he gives us clear admonitions. He gives us four in that passage. First, he says this, take heed that no one deceives you. You know, (laughs) this whole issue about deception is really interesting. Number one, deception is extremely deceiving. The guy that's deceived never goes, you know, I think I'm deceived. He's deceived. (laughs) But secondly, in the body of Christ, I think there are fear, not think, I know, there are fear-mongering preachers who use deception as their corner on the market, and what they do is they, they beat everybody over the head with, that guy's a deceiver, that guy's a deceiver, that guy's a deceiver, watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Listen to me, because I'm telling you truth. Just sign up. $9.99 a month, you'll get all my good content to keep you out of deception. I see Jesus declaring truth, 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 and not even hardly dealing with the deception. Because here's the thing, once you know the truth, the deception gets so evident. Get so rich in the word, so alive in the word. Don't listen and take my word for it. Listen, you listening to me, to my podcast, to Jeff, to his podcast, to our preaching, that's wonderful, but all we're doing for you is reading the menu. We're telling you what we've eaten and digested and then reading the menu to you so you can go eat and digest the word. This whole idea, people say, well, I'm not going to that church anymore. They didn't feed me. I go, well, don't come here because we won't feed you either. What do you mean? I go, me telling you about how God has ministered to me through his word is not you eating. That's me telling you about how awesome my meal was. I'm reading you the menu. This is awesome. This is awesome. It's awesome but you have to go and get in the word yourself and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, abundantly. 2 Thessalonians 2 is so clear that at the end of the age, deception comes and takes people away, and the Bible is so, so, so clear. It says, because they didn't love truth. Everybody thinks they love truth. We don't love truth. We don't love truth. We we self-deceive all the time. There's something about truth, it's more like an alarm than it is a a cozy blanket. It's really true. (laughs) I'm like, truth is true. 5 a.m. comes, you got to get out of bed, the alarm goes off. Ah, 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 ah. The truth is, get out of bed. Self-deception is, if I just snooze, I won't be late. (laughs) And you cozy blanket your way through life and you're late to every appointment. I'm telling you, there's an appointment the planet has you cannot afford to be late to. You hearing me? So love truth. Digest the word. Get in it yourself. Love the word. It'll keep you from deception. Secondly, Jesus says this, see to it that you are not troubled. See to it that you're not troubled. People get, they get so spun out. They get so gripped with fear, so full of anxiety. And the the New Testament is so focused on us building our inner life, building the love of God in our spirit, living in the peace of God. 
So that when trials and tribulations and difficulties and all sorts of sufferings happen to the saints, we are not thrown off. Your Christianity, we never even get to see what your Christianity is until it's under pressure. Look, anybody can say praise the Lord, hallelujah, when everything's awesome. You don't have to be a Christian to do that. But when you're going through the fire, when you're suffering, when things aren't going the way you wanted, when God's leading you in a way that you did not desire to be led, can you still say you're faithful and true? All your ways are just and true. You're good in all you do. Your love and your peace and your beauty and your leadership is perfect. So Jesus said this, see to it that you're not troubled. How is that possible? First, get, round, get grounded in the word. Secondly, obey what the scripture says. Colossians 3, he says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. David said this, Lord, search my heart, find the anxieties, and get rid of the wicked ways in me. Equating the anxieties and the worries to wickedness. We're so addicted to anxiety in our culture. We're so full of outrage. Our whole culture is built on it right now. The whole whole news media is just looking for the next thing to get you outraged. Why? So you'll watch their newscast, so you'll click on their link, because if you click on their link and you watch their newscast, guess what, baby? They're getting paid. So they want to get you so outraged that you live your life looking for the next crisis to hear what they have to say so you can continue to pay for the outrage. People live like that. Get out of that cycle. They're not trying to help you. They're not trying to give you fair and balanced. They're not. They're trying to move as much of your money into their pocket as possible. That's what the game is. (laughs) <laughs> you go into, just a side thought, just, just a little word of wisdom. When you go buy a new car, and that guy says, how can I help you? What he's saying is, how can I move as much of your money into my pocket as possible? How can I help you to give me as much money as possible? Now, if you sell cars, God bless you. I don't believe you do that. I believe you're trying to help them. And if you're not, we got an altar call for you at the end of the service. All right, so here's the thing. To see to it that we're not troubled, it requires us to look at the words of Jesus, allow those words to dwell in our hearts. So when Jesus says, this is what the sign's gonna be, guess what? I know it's gonna be okay because Jesus is leading this show. We sang it today, and I was sitting there as we were singing it thinking, do we know what that says? We sang it, you are worthy to open the scroll and loose the seals. That's Revelation 6, the lamb opening the scrolls, opening the seals on the scroll to do what? Initiate all the events of the tribulation. Let me tell you something. The end times, it's not about uh, 666 or Lucifer or the Mark of the Beast or Damien or whatever, Freddy Krueger. The end times is about the revelation of Jesus Christ to the planet. And there's only one that opens the scroll that unleashes the end of the age drama, and that's Jesus. So when he tells me, hey, it's going to get intense, I go, okay, I trust you. You're telling me tomorrow's headlines now. I trust you. And then he says, these things must come to pass. It's going to happen and it's gonna happen my way. That's what he's saying. I'm creating a context by which my kingdom will come in fullness on the earth. You can trust me in this. Don't be deceived. See to it that your heart is not troubled. All these things must come to pass. And then the final thing he says, and I'll end with this, he says, but the birth pangs aren't the end. And in that part of the chapter, he's telling us, there's a much more severe time coming. Great tribulation is coming to the planet. And beloved, I I just think this. We have to be so alert and aware of Jesus, what he said and what his word says, that our hearts are not weighed down and burdened. 
When my phone started ringing on Tuesday night, I just, I just said, Holy Spirit, Lord, anything that we need to know? We've got people over there, anything? One of the locations that Iran threatened is a city where we have people. What do we need to do, Lord? He goes, see to it that you're not troubled. Yes, Lord, these things must come to pass. And I'm telling you, by Wednesday, we were planting that tree out there. I thought, Lord, you are so cool. There's no one that leads like you. I I can trust you completely. Through difficulty, through trial, through challenge, through blessing, through all of it, I can trust you. You're good. Beloved, we need to be a people that are alert, awake, watchful, and ready for the hour that's getting ready to unfold on the earth. Amen? Amen and amen. All right, you may stand. Let's stand for a moment. See, I I notified you when to stand. Going to pray. I was going to the mall, make this short. I was going to the mall over the holidays. I was asking the Lord for a good parking place because I'm spiritual like that. And I mean, every row, no parking, no parking, no parking. I, and I'm driving forever. I think I finally found a parking place about three miles from the door. And I got in my car and I was complaining. Come on, Lord, I need a little more favor than that. If I pray, I need you to do what I need you to do. And I'm having to work out the issues of my soul on the way in that three-mile walk. He knew I needed it. And it just dawned on me. I'm complaining over not getting a good parking place at the mall. And we're living in an hour that crisis is heightening in the earth, that many will be offended. And I thought about how low my threshold for offense is. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. The littlest things throw me off. Please forgive me. I want to stand firm unoffended in love. Though he slay me, I will trust him. That's what the church is supposed to be like at the end of the age. I want to pray for two things. One, maybe you're hearing this message and it's causing a a, a little bit of an alarm in your own soul in, in a way where you're saying, when I see these crises, I do, I begin to worry. I begin to get in fear. I don't want that. I want to come out of that. I wanna pray for you to get rooted in truth, to see to it that you're not troubled, to not be pushed around and owned by the media outlets, but to be owned by the scripture, by the Holy Spirit. And then secondly, there's some of you in this room, as I'm sharing, you're thinking, I want want a richness in understanding the end of the age. I wanna understand with clarity the details of the second coming of the Lord and the kingdom to come and the revival at the end of the age and judgment and the rage of Satan, the wrath. I wanna understand all of these pieces. I wanna know the end of the story so clear because I want to teach it to others. I wanna preach it to others. I wanna instruct others. Maybe you don't think it's, you don't have to be a platform thing. It could be anything. It could be any area of your life, just calling people to being alert. That you have revelation at the end of the age. I wanna pray for both of those things. I remember it's been, 17 years. I heard a message on the end times and the guy said, if you want revelation in this, I want to pray for you. If your heart's pricked and you're stirred. And he, and he just said, just, just raise your hand. And I remember I got that prayer that day. And from that day forward, my heart shifted. I was so hungry to understand the end of the story. Anyway, if either one of those applies to you, this challenge and fear that grips you when you see the crisis arise or you're hungry and you really want revelation of the end of the age i want to pray for you now if that's you just raise your hand all over the room lord thank you thank you for giving us the word on these things giving us truth on these things jesus i'm asking right now for those that are wrestling with fear that are thrown off by our culture of outrage, that that go into worry and anxiety over these challenging things. Lord, lift it off them right now. 
And I'm asking for grace to rest, grace to get rooted in truth, rooted in the love of God. A time when the love of many will grow cold, they'd be so rich in the love of God. And Father, secondly, I'm asking for the spirit of revelation to fall in this room right now on the many whose hearts are pricked and they want understanding. They will, they will gain understanding at a time of crisis. And the scripture says they will lead many to righteousness. Lord, let that hunger for the, the understanding of the end times, let it fall on many right now. That we be a, a company of proclaimers with clarity in our souls. Do that in our hearts right now, I ask. 